April 20th, 2010. 41 miles off the Louisiana coast, the Deepwater Horizon drilling rig, leased by BP, suffered a devastating blowout and exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a very chaotic time. 11 people lost their lives. Many others were injured. It was catastrophic. Deepwater was probably the most complex and diverse oil spill in the history of oil spills. People were very prepared for another Exxon Valdez. They weren't prepared for this. While the Coast Guard searched for survivors from the air, response teams worked to contain the fire at the surface. But in the deep sea, nearly a mile beneath the rig, the largest offshore oil spill on record was just getting started. The first time I saw a video of the discharging oil head, it literally took my breath away. I realized how truly bad this was and how difficult it was going to be to stop the disaster that was unfolding. Turn speeds are posted. Number one engine. I've got the gear up. Over the next 87 days, BP's Macondo wellhead discharged roughly 134 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. The unprecedented spill affected nearly 68,000 square miles of ocean surface and damaged 1,300 miles of shoreline across five states. Despite months of cleanup efforts, the spill became one of the largest environmental catastrophes in American history. I knew pretty early on that this was gonna be a marathon of sprint. It was one of the most intense periods of my scientific life. As a result of the developing spill, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, or GOMRI, was created with a $500 million grant from BP for peer-reviewed, independent research on the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. The Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative just transformed our knowledge of the Gulf of Mexico. We started with a clean whiteboard to try to understand what we thought would be important 10 years from that point. So what would we have to know to have a better response to it? Yeah, there's a lot going on here. Wow. What was the extent of Deepwater Horizon's damage to ecosystems deep in the Gulf of Mexico? And are we prepared for the next big spill? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources, and by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, strengthening America's future through education. Additional funding was provided by the William J. and Tina Rosenberg Foundation, and by the Do Unto Others Trust. Dr. Eric Cordes, a professor at Temple University, has been studying deep sea corals for more than two decades. They're not limited to shallow water. They're everywhere. They're in the Gulf of Mexico. We took a core through one of them and aged them at over 300,000 years. So these are structures that are living at geological scales. Look at that. Beautiful. These corals support biodiverse life in the deep ocean, providing nurseries, feeding grounds, and protection from predators. Some of the most productive fisheries in the world depend on them. Life-saving pharmaceuticals for diseases like cancer have also been developed from these corals. Every one of those species is doing something different. So if you lose one, you may be losing something really important to us that won't evolve again.
main deck control van. Uh, Bowers is coming in five. After the Deepwater Horizon disaster, Eric's work turned toward the spill's devastating effects on the deep corals in the Gulf of Mexico. As a principal investigator for the GOMRI-funded group EcoGate, he returned to the spill site. We're proceeding at a half a knot right now. Right to that. His focus was on Paramaricia, the coral species most impacted by the spill. Some of the colonies that were impacted were as old as 600 years. They grow very, very slowly, which sets up the possibility that it would take that long to recover. Eric says the impacts researchers found on the seafloor near the site were shocking. First corals we found, it was very obvious what was happening. There was oil covering it. There was tissue falling off of the skeleton that was essentially rotting away in front of our eyes. Eventually, entire branches started to fall off. The dirty blizzard event actually transported a lot of the hydrocarbons and dispersants from the surface down to the deep sea very rapidly. And we would see patches of impact all over the place where they looked like they were hit with a shotgun. I honestly didn't think that that kind of thing would happen. To better understand these impacts, Dr. Stephen Morosky and David Hollander at the University of South Florida have closely studied what became known as the Dirty Blizzard for the past decade. As leaders of the GOMRI-funded Sea Image, their focus is on the fate of Deepwater Horizon oil. It's a very complex set of circumstances that results in large quantities of oil from an oil spill actually reaching the bottom. The oil globules and droplets, they float. And as long as they're above a certain critical diameter, they'll come to the sea surface. At the surface of the oil slick, responders deployed nearly one million gallons of dispersants to keep the oil from moving toward fragile coastlines. Dispersants are like hand soap. The general theory is that when applied to the surface under wave action, it's sort of like washing your clothes. You know, you add the detergent, you've got the agitation, right? It creates the small droplets. And so it doesn't make the oil disappear. It can make it more soluble. It can make the droplets smaller. It's not some miraculous wonder drug that removes it from the system. At the Deepwater Horizon site, however, researchers observed unexpected impacts. The dispersants put so much stress on floating plankton and algae that they released streams of sticky mucus into the water. That is like a glue that puts not only the oil droplets, but the dead plankton and the fine particulate matter together in large globules, which actually are heavier than seawater, so it sinks. This sticky mixture of oil, dispersant, dead plankton, and other particles cascaded from the surface deep into the sea, blanketing the ocean floor like a dirty blizzard. Organisms that couldn't get out of the way suffocated. There was a trade-off involved, and I guess the concept was out of sight, out of mind. And you push it offshore and you're free and clear. But that turned out to be not the case. The oil and the dispersants are toxic a mixture, right? And so by having all that oil deposited uh, on the sea bottom, it's going to interact with all the creatures that live at the surface of the sediment and also the creatures that live in the sediment. And so that created a lot of uh, mortality. Okay, here it comes. It's estimated that up to 30% of the oil spilled ended up in the deep sea, contaminating vast areas of corals. These corals are feeding on all the food that's raining down from the surface waters. So when this came down, they were thinking they were getting this big burst of food. A lot of it was consumed, and that caused a lot of the impacts that were observed. As part of EcoGig's work to document the impacts of the spill, experts created a photo series of specific coral colonies over time. So even after the oil disappeared off of the corals, we could still recognize that impact, recognize what those colonies looked like years later. And that allowed us to find additional sites where we could conclusively find impacts from the spill. 
Unfortunately, that time series that we've been following, all those corals that were impacted during the spill, we haven't had a chance to get back there in a few years just because of the lack of funding, which is it's a shame because it's an amazing data set and we've learned so much from it. You never get those kinds of data in the deep sea. In the Cordes lab at Temple University, Eric's team has attempted to reproduce the impact they saw at their research sites with coral samples that had not been exposed to the deep water event. We're really interested in how the corals were actually dealing with the oil and dispersant exposure. So we brought some of the healthy colonies from one of our control sites that was far away from the spill. We collected some of them and we ran experiments exposing them to oil and dispersant at different concentrations. So we could really tease apart which one caused more damage and how exactly that damage was caused. We found that by itself, the oil actually wasn't that bad, but when we added the dispersant with the oil or the dispersant by itself, we saw more severe impacts. The work that they've done with corals in the deep water has been incredibly important because, you know, these animals respond to dispersants in many ways the way microorganisms do. They're also stressed. Eric's work provided a window into impact that I don't think existed prior to their efforts. As the project director for the EcoGig Consortium, Dr. Samantha Joy's research into the impacts of the deepwater oil spill has also spanned the last decade. Her intense focus on the fate of the oil has led to questions about the effects of the dispersants on the very bacteria they're meant to assist. The general idea of dispersants is that it's breaking the oil up and then those droplets with their high surface area are accessible to these oil degrading microorganisms and it should be a feast for them. The best thing that can happen to oil is for a bacteria to chew it up, consume it, convert it to CO2, get it out of the system, it's not dangerous anymore. And that would be fantastic if that's what happened. But it's not clear that that's what happens. In her lab at the University of Georgia, Mandy and her team have worked to recreate the same conditions and results seen with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Mandy's team measured the response over time of bacteria in seawater by adding differing combinations of dissolved oil and dispersant, which allowed the team to distinguish between the effects of the oil and dispersant together and also each substance on its own. And by doing that, we saw the highest rates of oil degradation were in the presence of oil alone, and that when you added dispersants in with the oil, you reduce the potential for biodegradation, and that's a really important finding. The results of Mandy's initial experiments led to an even more striking discovery. There was something about the presence of nutrients, dispersants, and oil that seemed to maybe stimulate oil degradation a little bit. So we did a couple of different experiments aimed at isolating the effect of dispersants and nutrients. And we did this with surface water collected near the Deepwater Horizon wellhead. And when we did these experiments, I was astonished. In cases where the nutrients were added, Mandy says the microbes were more effective at degrading the oil. Where the nutrients were limited, the microbes were more stressed and the rate of biodegradation plummeted. Adding dispersants only stressed the microbes further. All communities on Earth are stressed by something, you know, whether it's hot or cold or pH or light. Then if you stress them further by exposing them to detergents, for example, that's going to be a double negative. You know, they've been punched once because they're nutrient limited and now you're punching them again by exposing them to a dispersant. Mandy says her team's discovery about the impact of nutrient levels on the effectiveness of dispersant could potentially change future oil spill response. If you can predict the result that you see based on the nutrient content, you, you've got, 
you've got predictive capacity. You can make a better judgment in terms of whether or not you should apply dispersants because sometimes adding nutrients alone might be a good solution. By applying nutrients, you're increasing the fitness of this population and by increasing their fitness, they're able to endure and tolerate what would otherwise be something that is an inhibitory stressor. Mandy's findings may also solve a different kind of scientific problem. In many studies on dispersant effectiveness, there have been a wide range of results. She says her nutrient discovery suggests that the way experiments are being conducted is the determining factor. Everybody's getting an answer that is reflective of the status of the system they're studying. It really sort of takes away this cloud of you're right and I'm wrong, and it turns that into a spectrum of responses, and it, it changes the conversation completely in, in, from one that's antagonistic to one that is very cooperative and synergistic, and we can all sort of figure out, okay, let's figure out the best thing to do for this ecosystem without impacting the system in a negative way. And, and really, that's what everybody wants to do. We've just gone about it in, in different ways. And that's the conversation changer. It's not right or wrong. It's how can we make them most effective? Let's spray on. Some members of the scientific community say Mandy's groundbreaking research calls into question the wide application of dispersants without first understanding and assessing their full impacts. We done? We're done. You know, this is one of the tried and true approaches to oil spill remediation. And that can have a negative effect to the system, to the biology, to the ecology as an ecosystem, and to basically all the environments from the marsh systems down to the bottom of the sea. One of the many unprecedented aspects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill was the application of more than 750,000 gallons of surface dispersants at the wellhead below. What we're seeing here is sort of a wand of dispersant trying to be added into the rising oil and gas exploding petroleum coming out of the wellhead. The argument was, you know, if we applied dispersants in the subsurface, we should be able to mitigate all oil coming to the surface. In the early days of the deep water disaster, oil evaporating at the surface made the air above the site toxic, forcing responders to wear respirators while they worked to contain the spill. That was the underlying justification to do this. And again, it was experimental because nobody had ever tried it before, which is a reasonable thing to do if, if it works. But research conducted since then has called this subsea dispersant injection into question. At the time of the Deepwater Horizon blowout, Dr. Claire Paris at the University of Miami had developed open source computer modeling of the ocean systems to trace the transport of particles and movement of fish larvae. She received a grant to modify her models and trace the paths of oil droplets from the wellhead instead. I started building this uh, model where now I didn't have particles anymore, I had droplets and it was reading the temperature and the salinity of the ocean circulation model to change the buoyancy of the droplets. So it was completely connected with the ocean. I remember the first time we ran the simulation and we saw actually the droplets rise in three dimension. It was amazing, like you couldn't believe it, we could actually do that. Claire's oil transport and fate model accounts for varying ocean temperatures, salinity, currents, circulation, topography, depth, and pressure changes, and even the effect of wind at the ocean's surface. The modeling is really intense calculations, and so to do that we use supercomputers from the Center of Computational Science of the University of Miami because we have to release so many oil droplets. We release 10,000 particles every two hours for, in this case it was 86 days, but then after the spill is done, we need to continue to track the whereabouts of the oil. Claire says her modeling of the oil droplets from the spill resulted in a surprising discovery. The addition of subsurface dispersant was unnecessary in deep water 
because the oil is dispersed naturally on its own. The deeper the wellhead is, the more compressed the gas. And when it opens and there is a difference of pressure, it's like a bomb that explodes because it's sudden change of pressure and the gas suddenly expands and atomizes the oil in droplets. And so what we saw immediately was that the small droplets never rose. Claire's model showed that smaller droplets accumulated instead at depth, predicting the presence of a massive underwater plume of oil, which was later confirmed by researchers at the site. Early modeling research had said that this might be a possibility with a deep blowout, but nobody had ever demonstrated this before. So those deep plumes were forming in the absence of the use of dispersants, and that's a critical piece of information when we talk about the relative importance of the dispersants versus the natural processes, because if they're forming, and they're forming in mass, and they're extending over tens of kilometers, then that means that the natural processes have to be very significant. This was basically just spitting in the wind, literally. And so I think during the Deepwater Horizon event, it was wishful thinking to believe that subsurface dispersants actually played a role in mitigating the oil distribution. So it begs the question, do we really need to apply millions and millions of gallons of dispersants at the wellhead to get the same effect? While deeper wells may naturally disperse oil more effectively, some researchers suggest that the implications of depth for future accidents are sobering. With the BP spill resulting in $61 billion in total costs and damages, a more disastrous spill looms as a frightening possibility. The oil industry is heading to the center of the Gulf in extremely deep water. Deepwater Horizon was at a mile. There are many oil wells out there that are two miles and deeper. And so that's becoming farther and farther offshore. In 2017, for the first time, more oil was produced in what we call ultra deep wells than in shallow wells. Ultra deep are 1,500 meters or basically a mile deep and deeper. And that trend is accelerating. And that's a wholesale change in the industry. And the question is, have regulations kept up with those changes? Are they better prepared in the event of a blowout or of a large scale oil spill? And I think many would submit, no, they're not. There's a direct relationship between the depth of the facility and the frequency of accidents. All right, so this includes not only things like unconstrained blowouts, but it also includes worker injuries and other things. It's just a, a much more challenging environment as you go deeper and deeper, the enticement is that the wells flow faster because they're under higher pressure. So you get a much higher um, yield on your effort. Um, but that's also going to mean, how do, you, how do you put that genie back in the bottle if it gets loose? It took 87 days to cap the Deepwater Horizon wellhead. Imagine a situation in 3,500 meters of water. It's a nightmare scenario. Nature is amazing. The past decade of GOMRI funded research into the impacts of BP's Deepwater Horizon disaster have resulted in vast amounts of new data and valuable knowledge. However, researchers warn that the next blowout will not be a carbon copy of the 2010 accident. Chances are it's not. As a matter of fact, statistically, from an actuarial point of view, the chance is zero. So we can't use the past to fight the next war. We have to be prepared to think out of the box. How do we actually get ahead of the curve here? How do you plan for everything when your mental model is something that occurred in the past? Now we know where it went. It's not out of sight, out of mind. There is a cost. It may be valued in dollars, but it could be valued in completely different ways. We have to take everything that we have learned, make sure that policymakers and responders are aware so that we can nip problems in the bud and be as effective as possible. And now our expansion of drilling in the deep ocean makes it almost inevitable that there'll be another accident. There's no good environmental impact assessment for things like that. The only way to not have those impacts is to not be doing those things. 
how badly do we need that oil? You know, I mean, we really should be moving off an oil-based economy and into renewables anyway. And so do we have to find every drop of oil in every sensitive habitat on Earth, right? At some point, it becomes not worth it. Over 95% of all the living space on this planet is in the deep sea. But we're still discovering entire ecosystems that we didn't know of before. We're gonna screw up a system we don't even know about. And we're gonna, in retrospect, we're gonna say, geez, you know, why didn't we think about this? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources, and by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, strengthening America's future through education. Additional funding was provided by the William J. and Tina Rosenberg Foundation, and by the Do Unto Others Trust.